Hello, all the beautiful people. This is Lisa from Living Life with Lisa. And today we're going to start the question and answer video. However, I think most likely you're going to see a lot of different scenery. You're going to see a lot of different clothes, a lot of different lighting, because I have tons of questions. <laughs> And very few of them overlapped and so in order to make this viewable it uh, and not be an hour and a half long we I might have to cut up into different segments and do it on different days um, just see how far I can get um, with these um, questions and I'm gonna have to read them uh, so bear with me and I don't okay I'm going to start off with the questions that were left on um, the YouTube site and then I'll go into the Facebook questions. And so uh, I may give shout outs to the YouTube uh, community um, for the questions and probably not so much with the Facebook because I didn't get permission. Um, and on YouTube land, you know, it's always better to have a shout out. So. I'm going to go with that. So, uh, Jupiter asked several questions and, well, a couple questions. I, I broke them up. And uh, one was, um, what is the paper and pen test that I keep talking about? And that is um, actually just a test where there's different ones. There's the mocha and the... MMSE, I have it written over here on my wall, <laughs> so I look, um, test, and there are two different tests, and one of them uh, is like worth 30 points, and depending on how many points you get, um, it depends on your score, and somewhere I forget the cutoffs, but um, when I first started taking the um, I took uh, mocha. Uh, I think I took the mocha test most of most of the time, and um, so you get thirty possible. When I first started, after I got sick, um, I was getting twenty-seven out of thirty, and that's really really good. And what um, as we progressed over the years, I would continue to take tests. They have several versions of the same test, so it's not always exactly the same, but it's pretty much the same test. And then there's other tests I would take, um, pencil and paper, throughout there that that I don't know the names of. But for I'll get into examples in a minute. But um, there's several different ones where they ask you questions, and a lot of them memory tests or comprehension, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, re uh, repeating things, um, figuring out going forwards and backwards and things like that, um, fl flexibility, reasoning, um, all those kinds of things are covered on it. Um, and a lot of times they find strengths and weaknesses. It's not all, all bad. So um, that's what paper and pencil is. Um, and then she asks, what are some of the questions? Well, it was, um, you know, I had to draw a clock. Um, I can't give all specifics because, it, one, it wouldn't be fair, and or I'm not sure even legal, but, and I don't know that I would remember anyway. But, for example, um, had to do things like put things in sequence. Um, there were questions like they they would read a story and then I had to repeat back everything I remembered about the story. Um, the I would be given a series of numbers and it would start out with like three numbers and I would repeat them back and then there'd be four numbers and then five numbers and however you know numbers and then um, once it got to a point I wasn't doing well they skipped on to the next part. Um, there were a lot of yes and no questions such as you know, is a garbage can larger than a trash can? And things like that. Is a um, bathtub, does a bathtub hold more water than a sink? 
and you say yes or no. Um, those kind of things. Um, the ones that I had problems with last time, apparently, uh, which surprised me because I thought I nailed them 100%, were the uh, ones on uh, the yes and no questions. And um, I usually ask which ones I, oh, I found my tripod. Uh, I couldn't find it, so I got a table set up with a mini tripod. Um, I missed up on the yes and no questions. Um, they also have the one where they pick a certain letter and then you have to tap on every time they say that letter and they just say a whole bunch of letters and every time they say that particular letter, tap. And I had that test a bunch of times. Um, in speech therapy and um, it was always the letter A. It's <laughs> I am so good at tapping on the letter A. You wouldn't believe how good I am at tapping on the letter A. And so when I went to the neuro uh, psychologist and had to take a test over there, they wanted me to tap on a different letter that wasn't A. And as I got into the test, I couldn't remember what letter I was supposed to tap on, and I automatically started tapping on A. And they were able to figure it out afterwards that the reason that I was tapping on A is because I tapped A so many other times because I was consistently wrong on their test, but I was consistently tapping on the same letter. <laughs> so, so I think I got like I have a point for that because. I didn't change my letters, uh, you know, it was always A I was tapping on, even though A was not the letter I was supposed to be tapping on. So those are just kind of the the things, and what would you do if um, you're on a trip and your wallet got stolen? Well, you know, those kind of, just different things like that. Um, problem solving, and it's just a whole realm of uh, cognitive functioning. And so they ask questions that work different parts of your brain and different ways of doing it. And then they can tell which parts are working and which parts aren't working so well. And which parts are doing really well. So that's what the pencil and paper test is. Because they can't, they don't know that by looking at it. They know it by your answers to these questions. And see, we're already at almost eight minutes and I've just gotten through two questions. So this is going to be a long one. Um, Carol asks, um, do I have supplemental insurance to get caregivers? No. There's, uh, n n no. Um, what um, happens is, is that if um, your um, insurance doesn't cover in-home help unless um, you're bedridden, usually, and so if you may, if, if it, like, if you're disabled, you can make a little bit more money than usual to give you a little bit more. But, um, so then you can have your regular insurance, which is mine, I ha I'm on now, Medicare, yeah, Medicare, and a Medicare Advantage plan because I'm not 65 yet, so I have to have another plan with the Medicare to go with it. So um, if I could have gotten Medicaid, um, if I qualified for that, then Medicaid would have paid through real services, uh, would have paid real services to find an agency to put help in the home. Um, I did not qualify for Medicaid. Um, I don't remember why. I. Uh, I think it was income, but then I think I got told that I don't I don't remember something got goofy, but anyway I didn't get it and um, um, but I can't remember the exact reason why. But anyway, um, if you have that, then it will help pay for that. Um, what I have is uh, real services came out and I. I'm not sure um, what people call real services 
anywhere else. I don't even know of other states that got real services. I really, I really don't know. But what it is, it's a organization. It's actually like um, Meals on Wheels and uh, Council on the Aging and and that sort of stuff. Um, but they they service a lot more than that. But those are the things that they're usually known for. Mills on Wheels and um, Council on the Aging. So that might help you give an idea of who I'm talking about. And so, um, so they came out, they assessed me, um, deemed and decided that I did need help um, in the home. And because I don't have Medicaid, yeah, Medicaid, I get those two mixed up all the time. Medicaid, um, I am, because I, I think because my income's too high. But anyway, um, they put me on the choice program. And so the choice program is, um, they look at my finances and my bills and um, what I need. And then they figure out, they've got some kind of system where they find out, um, how much I can pay into having somebody come in and so they uh, did their magic and sent me a letter and I have to pay one and a half percent of the uh, what they're paying um, for somebody to come in so now my caregiver right now I'm paying a hundred percent of her and so when um, the agency takes over which will be probably about the end of the, maybe the end of the month, um, I will pay um, six or seven dollars a week for that. And um, she'll actually be making a dollar less a day um, than what um, I was paying her. So I'll probably throw in that extra dollar because there's no reason for it to take a pay cut uh, of a dollar. But, um, no, it's not supplemental. It's, uh, just that, um, that's what these, this is set up for. Okay. Um, Jill asks, uh, several things. Um, one, um, why are so many people in denial? Um. Uh, my guess is, I mean, I don't know, I don't study this stuff, but, um, uh, because, my opinion, and it's strictly my opinion, people are in denial because who wants this? You know, who wants this? It's, um, you know, when you're told that... If, if it's one of those things, it's like if nobody tells you, it doesn't make it real. It's not real until you're told. And the diagnosis beforehand. I mean, I'm glad I got the glad got it. I did a whole video on why it was good to have it because the diagnosis because it opened up doors. You know, I wouldn't be getting help if it wasn't for that. Um, and like I said, I didn't change, but um, it's a disease that they're telling you that no, no matter what you do, you are going to end up not knowing anybody, not recognizing anybody not knowing where you're at, being afraid, um, possibly being nonverbal, possibly um, incontinent, um, and that that's not the way people want to go. I mean, most of us want to go out in a blaze of glory, and that's not a blaze of glory. It's It's a slow, slow, slow uh, way to go. And, you know, I was a caregiver for my mother who had cancer. 
and she had cancer in the lungs and cancer in the brain and um, it was stage four and she was given three weeks to live and she lived an extra year <laughs> and a week um, and so I ended up leaving work and caring for her uh, and taking care of kids at the same time um, uh, all the time and I would do it again in a minute I I made sure that I we did everything um, we got out we had fun we did you know had talks I that there was no regrets I mean um, I have no uh, uh, no regrets of the time that I spent that last year with my mother um, of anything that I did because um, I always made sure that that um, I could live with whatever decisions I made but I likened it to um, having duct tape stuck on your arm hairs and you have the duct tape on here and it's just being slowly pulled off a little bit at a time instead of just ripped off and being done and that's what this is it's pulling duct tape off the off the hair of your arm and nobody wants that um, I didn't want to um, this is one of, well it's just a personal story of mine when I was in my 20s I was watching during a them <laughs> during a snowstorm and uh, so I was watching um, PBS public broadcasting channel and they were doing showing documentaries and I'm one of those nerdy people that like documentaries and so I think it started out as a documentary on um, teaching because the lady was a teacher and she was one of those people that was real um, uh, how do I say this without um, offending any te teachers I, I was a teacher I still got that teacher in me that's why I do this I think but um, anyway she was one of those teachers that always talked softly and sweet and um, was always pleasant and her handbag always matched her shoes which matched her dress and you know what I'm I'm talking about and so they were following her around and um, she started having problems and her and her husband went to a doctor and told the doctor and they gave her series of tests and they diagnosed her with Alzheimer's and so then the show turned into a documentary about Alzheimer's and as her disease progressed um, she would go to the doctor and I mean she physically changed um, and she'd go to the doctor and he'd say well how are we today and she'd say well, I don't know how the hell you are but I'm doing fine and then the next time he'd ask her how she was doing and she'd tell him it was none of his damn business and um, she, I'm going to guess she never swore before that and um, it was getting harder and harder for her husband and she was getting um, so easily agitated and angry and um, so unlike the person that she was before and you know and he ended up having to put her in a home and and he just cried and cried and cried because he had to and I remember watching that in my 20s and thinking if I ever got that diagnosis I I just I just wouldn't I would make sure that I didn't live long enough to see the end of it and so that's a promise I've always kind of kept to myself and here I am um, right now I'm not planning on keeping that promise um, I'm working on it you know because I've got a long way to go before that and by the time I probably need it it'll be too late anyway I won't be able to do anything but it's um, 
there's a and it's also one of those this is turning into a really long answer but um, it's also there's the stigma of this is awful um, you know even the Alzheimer's Association um, does not recognize us as being productive human beings once we've been diagnosed they don't um, uh, for example you know the thing about not having any support groups you know how many people are diagnosed daily and when I left that office I was not given any information on it I wasn't given any kind of support nothing not even the number for the Alzheimer's Association nothing and um, so it's a a cut off from society it's um, becoming invisible um, it's because it's be it's a diagnosis that um, people blow you off and disappear they don't because they don't want to be there to watch it but you go down um, so I think a lot of that plays in the denial because you don't want to know something that's horrific and, and it's true with anything you know I uh, one time had uh, before I had my neck surgery I was I didn't know it was my neck and I hurt so bad down my arms that I thought I had bone cancer and I wouldn't go to the doctor and tell anybody because I didn't want to find out that I had bone cancer and so you know I think it's probably true with any diagnosis but I finally the pain got so bad I went and it turned out to be bad discs in my neck it wasn't the bone cancer um, she also asked um, oh about the pillbox um, I'm gonna stick a video in here because um, I got a film of the pillbox working. It works great. I have the white one. Um, my advice would be though to get the clear one because last night um, the alarm went off. I went in there and there were no pills. I didn't know it was on. I didn't know it was running low. If I'd had the clear one I'd been able to see that the trays were empty. Um, so I don't know how we're gonna work that out to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore but um, go with the clear but otherwise it, it has worked like a charm it's been wonderful and the clock that she's talking about move this a little bit is right here and it tells the week the time and the date and the year they've got them also that um, tell if it's morning or evening I thought that that's what I was ordering was one that had the morning and evening but I don't I didn't get that one I got the one without that um, what was the first thing I considered a priority when I first realized I had a problem um, my boys um, I had when when I when I did my will originally because that's what mature adults do when they have children is get a will <laughs> um, I had uh, left the boys um, with a relative and um, this particular relative ended up um, getting four I think he's up to four of his grandchildren um, living at his house that he's raising and um, after getting the getting knowing that I was going downhill because 
you know, I, like I've said many times, I, I kind of knew it before I got the diagnosis. Um, and so I looked at that and I thought about it and I thought, that's not going to work. That's not going to work at seven children. Um, and so um, I went and got um, somebody else to agree to take him, um, another family member. Um, as far as local people, I've had people coming out the woodwork <laughs> that are willing to to take them. Um, but uh, I want to keep them in the. I want to keep them with family. I'm not gonna give them to other people. Uh, but um, I do appreciate the fact that um, they're liked well enough that everybody wants them. Uh, but that was probably the biggest thing that I worried about, and also about and I still worry about this one, is um, what's going to happen if I am still at home. As long as I'm home, I want them home. And what if we have to have, I have to have a caretaker and they have to have a caretaker. You know, and um, now that my dad's moving up here, I think that's going to take care of itself. And... I'm still going with the, my, I got 20 years, 20 good years. So, I, um, sorry, I got, I can't read my own writing. Um, what was your journey to discovering, what was my journey to discovering that I had early onset dementia, symptoms, concerns, fears. Um, well, um, a lot of it um, well, I started having more problems. Um, I There was a day that I went in to brush my teeth and I pulled out the toothbrush and I couldn't remember what I was supposed to do next. I did, I um, knew I was supposed to do something, but I did, couldn't remember what the next step to brushing my teeth was. I couldn't remember that toothpaste that went on there. And I just knew something wasn't right, and I couldn't, I just couldn't figure out how to do it. And that scared me, it, because even though my mind at that moment is thinking I can't remember how to use this. Um, the back of my mind is saying warning, warning, um, something's not right um, because if uh, you've been brushing your teeth your whole life <laughs> um, and so eventually time passed and I remembered to brush my teeth and I brushed my teeth. Um, I had a dream that um, my neighbors um, got a divorce and, my, and that um, the husband um, was still kind of around it and he's a wonderful man. And she stayed in the house with the kids and she married an abusive man and um i was so upset because um i didn't want her with that abusive man and i wanted him back in the house her husband back in the house and um so when i got up i just couldn't shake the feeling i could not get past it and um I was outside doing something outside and uh, they drove past and I, I saw them coming down the driveway and their driveway runs along my property and I so I walked out to the road and when they got down by my driveway I flagged them down and I said I just need because I was gonna go over to their house that's how much it was bothering me and I said I just I just 
had a bad dream about you. I never told him what the dream was. So I had a bad dream about you, and I wanted to make sure you were all right. And gave them both a hug, and then I was fine. Because once I saw them, I was okay. And then I was watching a show called Designated Survivor, um, which is um, a show about, uh, in the in the United States, you get the president, but there's actually like 13 people in line. Um, there's a succession that if something happens to the president, then the vice president, you know, and some of that, and it goes all the way down to like 13 people. And anytime, and this is true stuff, this isn't the story, this isn't the show. Um, anytime that there's a um, State of the Union when everybody's there, when the vice president's there, and the leader of the house is there, the president's there giving a speech, and all the congressmen and senators and everybody's in the room, um, they always take out one of the one of the people that's in that line of succession, they take them out and they take somebody from Congress out and they hide them away from this thing um, so that if, God forbid, a um, an attack happened and killed everybody in the Capitol building because they're all in one place because the idea is to never have everybody in the same place place at the same time um, but at that whenever there's a state of the union they have to be together at the same place at the same time and so um, so they're called designated survivors the people they pull out and hide are are designated to survive in case of an attack during one of these state of the unions or anything that everybody's at so in the show, Designated Survivors, of course, the Designated Survivor, of course, this happened. The during the State of the Union, the Capitol building blew up and killed everybody inside. And this guy that was like number twelve um, became president, and this woman that was pulled out became the Congress. And they had, and it became their job to rebuild the government in the country. So. I was watching the show, and um, I, then I'd watch the news, and they would show the Capitol building, and I would think, they can't be using the Capitol building, it blew up. And it took me, like, days to figure out that I was confusing a TV show with real life. And that was uh, mostly because I was on prednisone. Uh, so prednisone and I don't get along very well. It makes me more cuckoo. Um, but uh, I started worrying a lot more when these things were happening. Plus, I had a friend that would always say, "Well, you know, when you have Alzheimer's, um, the emotions last a lot longer than the memory does." <laughs> And then she'd say, I'm sorry that I keep uh, referring to everything you tell me as Alzheimer's. And this is before I even had a diagnosis. Um, so uh, as I got tested more, um, the uh, m my speech pathologist was telling me my numbers were going down and giving me my numbers. And then... I had not ever spoken to my primary care, so I went and talked to him, and then the rest is history. Um, so those were some of the symptoms. Um, the fear, my, my fear when I was confusing TV shows uh, with uh, real life and thinking that dreams could possibly be real that I knew would be ridiculous because that's not going to happen because of the history of this couple, um, which I'm not going to go into. Um, it just trust me that those exact circumstances would never happen. I'm not saying they would never get divorced, but she'd never pick up a guy like that. Um, so, um, 
that started that that scared me because I felt like I was losing my mind and that I was um, losing touch with reality and I was terrified um, I went off the president uh, president uh, the steroid went off of it immediately um, and things started getting better after a few days but I still was scoring really low in, the, in there um, do do I know how my boys actually feel about the diagnosis and what difference it has made in their lives um, no I don't know how they actually feel about it I I get the feeling that they know that I have dementia, but I get the feeling that I'm their example of what dementia is, <laughs> if you understand. Um, and so um, it just means uh, short-term memory loss, and sometimes I can't drive in their world um, and there's some things I can't do um, the oldest one that seems to understand a little bit more he's become a low caretaker caregiver already it's uh, kind of breaks my heart but I do appreciate it a ton um, but he's still a kid and um, the youngest I don't think has a clue as to what it is because um, you know, this has been going on for five years and he's 10. So, um, he doesn't know any different. This is, you know, it's been a gradual MCI moving up, you know. Um, th those earlier videos are actually five years old. The ones at the beginning of, of the thing. I just put them all on a year ago because I figured out to use YouTube and I had saved my diary, my video diaries. Um, I didn't put them all up, but I put a, lot, a few up to give examples. And so, you know, when he's five, that's the way I was talking and acting. And so, to him, you know, now at ten, I'm I'm looking like a rock star compared to what I was. And so, um, the middle one acts out when he's afraid, and he usually calms down once I can show him that I um, can handle him and put him down um, so to speak um, because it shows him that if something if somebody was to um, come in I could take care of it and it wouldn't and it would not end well for the person that was invading my home in fact the youngest one tonight said um, made the comment that um, I wouldn't be nice and gentle mom if somebody was trying to take one of them away and I said no I said they'd either be dead or wishing they were dead and he said oh yeah I know and so um, I don't think they grasp fully what it means because um, we go with uh, the positive outlook of you know I'm on this medication stunts it you know we're talking a long time down the road before it gets too bad and um, they're with me on that and the middle one that's acting out right now, he his his fear has nothing to do with me. <laughs> He's scared to death that Kim Young Jewel, Ju, I'm now not saying it right. Kim Kong, the leader of North Korea, is going to nuke us, and so he lives in fear of that, which I understand because I grew up during the Cold War, and um, I understand it, but I don't know what to do about it because. Um, I've been there and I understand I understand the fear and right now that's his biggest fear I'm not his biggest fear <laughs> his biggest fear is North Korea um, 
it's going to make a big difference in their lives. I don't think they've realized that yet. Right now, it hasn't. We've kept up with all their activities. I've stayed involved in their activities. Um, as time goes on, they most likely will have to not be as involved in things, and their life will change. But right now, as of right now, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, so, um, I, I don't know that, um, they're noticing anything yet as far as change, if that makes any sense. Um, because I've been disabled for five years and last year I was in a wheelchair and, um, for that, you know, had trouble talking and, um, so right now I'm walking and talking well, so in their world I'm better now than I've been in five years even though I'm not and but I appear to be and they catch they catch me not knowing TV shows they and watching the same ones over and thinking I've never seen it before they catch me having the same conversations and they and it usually comes up when they're aggravated with me for repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, they notice that, but I don't know if um, they see that as the dementia or they see that as mom being goofy again. Because the majority, you know, five years, they've been through hell. And, um, you know, now it looks like the light at the end of the tunnel for them what symptoms am I aware of and what symptoms are others aware of I think others are aware of um, my forgetfulness others are aware of my problem solving problems um, others are aware of um, of mine not knowing them. I always think that I'm faking it and pulling it off and then they'll say, you don't know who I am, do you? And I'll have to admit that I don't. Except for the young man whose name was on his shirt. But he was never one of my brighter kids. Um, the symptoms I'm aware of is that um, I can't do anything past three steps. And sometimes two. Um, and that makes it difficult, um, and I notice, um, so I'm having a good day today, so it's hard to say what I notice. Um, other people notice slurred speech when I'm having a bad day. I don't notice that ever. Um, somebody has to point it out to me. Otherwise, I don't, I'm not aware of it. Um, I, I'm aware of the fact that um, I don't re remember things, um, and a lot of times it's things that I think I should know. Cheryl asks. Uh, she asked about the clock in the medical uh, medicine dispenser. I already showed you that. Um, it says, uh, do, do I have people to step up and care for the boys? I do. I do. I have a couple of neighbors that um, are, uh, I can call them when something arises, and they can be right there. Um, I have... Um, Three, at least three that I can think of right off hand that I could call um, in a heartbeat or the boys could call we get their numbers up and the boys can call them if they need um, assistance so yes we we have that covered Pam asks when did I start noticing changes in myself what were some of the changes well my situation was a little bit different in that um, when 
I got sick. I was actually um, standing in the cafeteria and talking to the librarian and directing kids at, at breakfast and my office was right across the hall and this kid was was not doing what he was supposed to be doing and I was having a conversation and I stopped and I said the kid's name and I said you need to start eating your breakfast and get to class and we went back to talking and then she stopped and said hey and named the kid said she just told you to stop talk stop portion around eat your breakfast and, and go to class and so I went back to talking after she said that and she just kind of looked at me like I had a horn sticking out of my head and she said I think you need to go sit down and I said why and she said because I think we lost you and so I walked over to my office and I sat down and next thing I know here comes the school nurse and then I'm in the hospital and then I'm talking with marbles coming out of my mouth and I am stuck in uh, speech therapy and occupational therapy and physical therapy for like forever um, so all that kind of happened and um, and it was kind of a build up from that and because um, they were having trouble finding out, figuring out what had happened. Um, my holistic doctor, which I didn't have at the time, um, so okay, um, I went to um, the traditional medicine route. I was in the hospital. They couldn't find anything. I could not speak. I could not use the right side of my body. Um, they came in, speech came in, and wanted me to name as many animals as I could in a minute. And I named the dog, cat, and a turtle. And she said, stop. And I cried because I know my animals. And it seemed like that I said it that fast, and the minute was up already. Um, it was... It was awful, and I, I mimicked, I ap appeared as someone who had traumatic brain injury. And um, so it was rough going um, in 2013. And so that happened in March, and then um, I was sent to... Um, a neurologist in a nearby town and he sent me over to Chicago because we knew that this was hereditary because I had to learn to talk again and I um, used Skype and I had to have two cousins that um, I'm really close with and I Skyped with them and I didn't find out till later that they had figured out that I had the same thing that the other five members in my family that had passed away within a year had because I had picked up their mannerisms with the picking of the clothes and the rocking and the way I talked and the mannerisms I had. And they recognized it. I wasn't picking up on it. Um, they told me later. And both of them told, and the one told me that he said he, he cried every time we turned off the Skype. Um, he drove all the way from Arkansas up to Chicago to um, go to this appointment with me. So I walk in, we, we go into this appointment, and I had my caregiver and who, um, just for the sake of the story, was Hispanic, and then I had my cousin who was from the Deep South and with the uh, southern twang to go with it and then they had me that had marbles in my mouth and sounded like blah, 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 blah. Um, and so this doctor comes in and says um, who's the patient and I raised my hand and she said you don't have ALS <laughs> so I said well good because I didn't think I did and um, she said, well, somebody think you, thought you did because they sent you here. And I said, well, I don't know why. 
and so she went to examine me and I had to walk for her. She wouldn't let me use a cane, so my legs were about five feet, feet apart, and I'm walking like this to keep from falling because I'm afraid of a ball. And um, we get back, and um, she deems me as normal, and um, <laughs> and suggests that um, uh, that my speech. Um, because I, if you watch those videos, I don't sound like I can find my way out of paper bag. Um, suggested that that was normal for me, that I just wasn't that bright. And, um, I said, and she turned around, she hadn't looked at us. My dad says, the more letters you have after your name, the stupider you get. And she flipped around. As <laughs> I knew I'd get a rise out of her. I said, because you get these blinders on in your specialty, and if it doesn't fit in your little area, you don't have any idea what it is. Nothing out here exists. It's just all, if it's not in here, you don't have no idea. And so then my cousin leaned over, and he said, what we need is somebody that can think outside the box. Can you recommend somebody that think outside the box? And well, go, going back before that, she said uh, when she implied that I was just stupid, I said no, no, I write books, and I'm a teacher. I didn't say that that gracefully, but I said it. And he said no, she's sharp. She's this is not normal. And he explained that was a family thing and a hereditary thing and so we um so after i called her stupid and um he told her that we wanted somebody who could think outside the box um she tried to get all nicey nice with this which was too late and so she left the room and said told us to have a nice day i did not hear her say tell us to have a nice day but adele um my caregiver did and so um, we left, and and my cousin said, um, he said, I, you could have told me how people were treating you, but I never imagined how bad it was until I saw it with my own two eyes. Um, and he was hot. I mean, he was hot. And he walked us to the doc, walked me to the car, and we discussed that um, we need to find out what this was. And that um, he had my permission to do an autopsy after I died because we had to figure out what this was because we could not continue to have this happen in our family and not know what's going on. And I said, well, what do you want to do? Because I live two hours from Chicago and um, he lived 13 hours from Chicago. And he said, I'm going to go to my home. And I said, you sure don't want to go to my home? And he said, no, I'm going to go back. He said, I'm mad. And I'm mad enough that I can stay awake. Well, I found out that he was. And he called every attorney he knew, all the way from Indiana, all the way down to, <laughs> down to Arkansas, to see if he could go after these people. But he couldn't. And so... Um, I, on the other hand, had to call and text all the people that I was supposed to inform about how this how this went, and I had to call my dad. And she had said to me, um, a neurological, let's see, neuro, a degenerative neurological disease, no treatment, no cure, was her final um, diagnosis after make your arrangements um, after. Um, we called her stupid and so um, when I called my dad I said uh, I, I'm using my cell phone and so if um, I can't uh, if I drop if the call gets dropped then um, it's because we lose connection and the truth was we were in the middle of downtown Chicago we were going to lose drop signal but I just did not want to talk to him I didn't want to talk to anybody 
And so I told him what they said, and he said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Just don't give up. And then people were texting me how to go, and I would text them. Uh, degenerative neurological disease, no treatment, no cure. And everybody text back, don't give up. And I was so agitated by that. You know, give me solutions. Don't tell me not to give up. I have tried everything I know to try. I help, you know. And um, so Adele said, uh, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I want a margarita. And she said, really? <laughs> and I said, yeah, what harm is it going to do me now? And uh, so um, we stopped and, and got a margarita. And so I was talking to her, and um, she said, well, I think what happened was that she came in and she saw um, a Mexican, and then she saw a good old country boy with a southern twang who automatically didn't know anything because he had a twang, and then you, who can't complete a sentence, and so she just assumed there wasn't anybody in the room that had two brain cells put together and I said well that's probably true and um, I said you know what really bothers me is when you know somebody tells you something like that don't say don't give up give them an idea of something to do and she said well I don't think you better be alone tonight I think you need to call somebody to come spend a night with you so I called a friend and she said I've already planned to co on coming over and I said okay so Adele stayed with me until my friend got here and Adele had said uh, she said well, what really ticked me off is that woman told you all that stuff and then she says have a nice day how are you supposed to have a nice day after you hear all that and I said well I didn't hear the nice day so we get back to my house finally and we're just sitting visiting and finally my friend gets here so Adele gets ready to leave and as she's leaving she said <laughs> she said uh, don't give up and I said well you have a nice day <laughs> and so we both laughed and she she went on um, and so uh, then a friend of my neighbor that I was talking about earlier had the dream about called me and she called me and she said now shut up and I, whenever she says that on the phone, I know that it means that she's getting ready to say something serious and she needs me to not interrupt. And I said, okay. And she begged me to go see Dr. Anderson over in Goshen and told me all the wonderful things he'd done for her in-laws. And um, so I agreed. I mean, what, what did I have to lose at that point? And so I went over to see Dr. Anderson and he looked at my blood work and he took a piece of paper and he drew a line down the middle and he wrote down all the things that were wrong and then he wrote down solutions to all the things that were wrong and then he turned to me and he said I'm all about quality of life do you want quality of life and I said yes and um, then his second question was anybody else in your family have this <laughs> first doctor to ever ask me that after we begged and pleaded for them to listen to me say that and I said yes as a matter of fact and I told him well unbeknownst to me he did a genetics test and found the mutation uh, the MTHR MTHFR mutation and found that I had double copy of it and uh, then treated me and that has made all the difference in the world. Um, you know, he sent me, um, he put me on supplements. Um, I take vitamins that have already been chewed, as I say. They're already broken down. I take um, B12 shots, injections every other day. Um, I take me L-methylfolate, uh, L which is folic acid that's already broken down because folic acid does not break down and does not go through the cycle so therefore I don't absorb vitamins and nutrients or anything from my food 
but the methylfolate, if I take it every day, then that helps the process a little bit and I can get some of the nutrients out of my food. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question or not. I forgot what the question was. Um, oh, when did I start noticing changes? Um, so this stuff has been going on for a long time and I would have what we call episodes which were like TIAs and then I'd be down and then I'd go back um, to physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy and I'd keep getting tested and then I started getting worried you know like when the, the toothbrush stuff and I requested that I get speech therapy and went in and did all the testing and that's when she told me that um, you know, when I started having all these other, the dream that wouldn't go away, the capital building thing, and the toothbrush thing, um, I requested to go see her, and she did testing, and then the testing came out lower, because she had been testing me for years, so she knew it, and she even pulled out the 31, she said, let's get 30 out of 30, and I said, okay, and I got 20 out of 30, um, so, uh, it definitely had gone down and then the more extensive tests were were um, not not as good and um, so I kind of had help in seeing that things weren't going well uh, because of my close connection with with the OTPT and speech therapist um, they noticed when I had changes and they pointed them out and many times they sent me to the hospital um, and so I had that safety net I had my PT is a former student of mine so she knew me in my really good days um, and so that helps tremendously um, so some of the changes I didn't necessarily notice they picked up on and shared them with me Um, next we're going to get into Facebook questions I'm already past an hour um, so uh, I'm going to cut it off for tonight and go to bed and so uh, I don't know how this is going to be broken up and so I'm going to say bye for now and we will start the Facebook questions uh, tomorrow and I don't know how many episodes this is going to turn out to be or how it's going to be but um, there are quite a few Facebook questions, so it's going to take at least that long. So I think probably what I will do is um, I may just put the whole thing up. I'll put it on my computer and upload it overnight and just do the whole thing. Um, because you can just watch it at your leisure. Pause it, come back to it, whatever. Um, because I really don't want it to be a whole series of uh, question answers. I just want it to be one. So, with that, I'll let you go for tonight, and I will see you all later. Bye-bye.